This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host, researcher and entrepreneur, Ollie Tikkanen. Welcome, everyone. I am very excited about the guest of today's episode. He has a PhD from psychology. He's doing consultancy work through exercise cognition. Among many other things, he did his post- postdoctoral fellowship at NASA Ames Research Center in California. He has worked on a project with Intel in Ireland. He has designed, built, and evaluated game-based solutions for exercise and obtained $12 million technology-related funding. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to introduce our guest, Dr. Stuart Smith. Welcome, Stuart. Ollie, hi, how are you? I must admit it's an honor to be interviewed by you. No, it's, it's fully my honor. Uh, you have a very interesting background, so could you tell us more about your background? Sure. Look, I was uh, one of those kinds of kids that always liked to pull apart technology, um, much to the chagrin of my parents whose television or radio sets often wouldn't work because I'd pull them apart and forget how to put it back together properly. So from a very early age, I've been really interested in technology and how you can make use of it. Um, I started out life actually as an electrical engineering student because I was interested in how you might be able to build robots um, and in particular robots that could wander around on distant planets. I was a bit of a space geek when I was much younger as well and uh, grew up in the time of the original Star Wars movies and really wanted to be able to build those kinds of uh, humanoid robots that could wander around distant planets. So that sort of um, set me down a path of Um, becoming a student engineer, where I was essentially really interested in the in the mechanisms of motor control and sensory um, representations of the world. Now, as happens, I wasn't a very good engineering student. I tended to fail most of my classes, and at the end of uh, a couple of years of that degree, mm-hmm. I was uh, somewhat subtly suggested by the dean to go and do something else, uh, and that landed me in the field of psychology, um, which I then worked in for a number of years. Um, so my, my undergraduate degree was actually in in psychology or Bachelor of Science in psychology. I did a master's um, as well, a master of science uh, in the psychology faculty at the University of Sydney, and then uh, graduated through to a PhD also in psychology at a different university. So that's my academic background. Yeah, so very interesting that you went from the robots to to psychology but i guess the motor control part of human and robot it's it's kind kind of similar or at least you try to copy features from the yeah. from human robots right exactly yeah i mean that was the the really interesting thing is that in 1985 86 when i was a student of engineering trying to think about how you build robots Um, it was an incredibly complex task and it wasn't just movement. It was also how robots could see and early attempts at computer vision were laborious and really quite challenging. Uh, And then when I moved over and started studying psychology and how uh, humans respond to the world, it was fascinating that one of the the professors that um, guided me and who eventually became my PhD supervisor His area of interest was the human visual system and human visual perception. And what captured my attention was that the research papers that he was introducing us to were talking about the parts of the monkey brain that were responsible for encoding visual information. And what was amazing was that the language that he was using to describe the way in which the brain processes visual information from neural recordings was couched in very similar terms that we were using in engineering to describe the the visual world. It was about contrast sensitivity, um, spatial frequency analysis, Fourier analysis. And I immediately thought that there was this amazing crossover between the biological world, how we understand how the brain works, and the physical engineering world. And and that really, I guess, um, started me down my passion about thinking about human biological systems 
uh, and how they work from a, an engineering perspective. Mm, yeah, I think the visual system is quite a good example of that it works quite similarly to a certain point like like the machines would would do it. Did you did you study further this visual thing or was it just for a short time? Yeah, no my, my so my master's research was looking at um, the eye movements that are induced as a consequence of vestibular stimulation. So the, the the sensory and organs that we have in our inner ears that judge head movement through space. And so I I did a lot of work on um, measuring eye movements in uh, in um, head rotations. Then my PhD was in um, visual perception and in particular visual spatial orientation mechanisms. How do we use information about the visual world to give us a sense of where we are in space? And then I actually um, saw a job ad for a postdoctoral fellowship at NASA Ames in California and the job ad read, we're looking for somebody that has got background in, in vestibular eye movement research, so tick, that's my master's, in um, visual mm. psychophysics, so tick, that's my PhD research, and computational modeling of visual processes. And I did a little bit of that uh, through my PhD. So I thought, well, you know, uh, what's the chance? I used to be, uh, you know, a big space geek, always wanted to work in the space industry somehow. And here was a postdoctoral fellowship at NASA, one of those cool research organizations that it, it's almost like I'd written the job ad myself because I, I hit all of the criteria and was lucky enough to then um, get a job uh, at Ames um, in, in the early 2000s. That work was um, probably more back to um, pure vestibular work and, in fact, applying um, the, the scientific methodology around psychophysics to understand how humans can perceive their translation through the world when there's nothing else that can guide them. So when you just give a pure vestibular stimulus, can you tell the direction that you're moving? But then that kind of made mm. me start thinking about, well, how does visual information integrate with vestibular information? Uh, and as happened, I, I picked up a, an academic post at Trinity College in Dublin in the Faculty of Psychology there, but I, I met a guy called Heinrich Bulthoff from the Max Planck Institute of Biological Cybernetics, and he was really interested in um, how humans integrate all sorts of sensory information to guide their navigation through the world. And with Heinrich, we did some research where we looked at the combination of visual stimuli and vestibular stimuli for enabling people to make a judgment about um, the direction that they're moving through the world. So I, I kind of continued down the path of doing some vision research um, whilst I was in Ireland. Um, but Ireland was actually a pivotal point in my career, um, and I'm happy to talk about that um, now. Mm. If, if I still go back to back to working at NASA, how how was it? Did it meet your expectations? So how, how was the work at NASA? Mm. Uh, it was um, it was cool for a, a geek like me, who was always a space nut, um, to land in California and work at NASA. It was just absolutely mind blowing. I mean, the equipment and the facilities that they had there was from the Apollo program and earlier. Um, it was just uh, amazing to be embedded in that environment. And in fact, the group that I worked in, the Human Factors Division, um, there were researchers there who were some of the premier vision researchers in the world whose papers that I'd read for years mm. as an, an undergraduate and a graduate student. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm in the office next door to one of the leading lights in vision research. Um, so when you, you come from Australia where it's a relatively small research community and in particular um, back in the 1990s to suddenly be, land, be landed in the heart of Silicon Valley and within a 30 mile radius with some of the top vision researchers in the world. Uh, it was just amazing. It was a, an awe-inspiring experience. It was a frightening experience. I mean, you go to talks there and you've got some of the cleverest people alive um, tearing your ideas apart. Um, but I think that was a good thing for for an Australian research student um, to then um, have that, that opportunity to be um, exposed to some of those really challenging intellectual uh, experiences. Mm. And how, how was the practical implications NASA was look, looking for from the eye movement and vestibular integration yeah. uh, so, studies. So, so essentially uh, humans have evolved in a one gravity environment. I mean, there's the fundamental sensory uh, in system that we have is our ability to detect our orientation with respect to down, with respect to the direction of gravity. 
Uh, and in fact, all of our physiological systems and our biological systems have evolved within a 1G environment. We have a skeletal system that keeps our body upright against the force of gravity. Our heart muscles have to be strong enough that they can pump blood up against the force of gravity into our brain to ensure that we can mm. continue to, to operate. Um, and then when we're in microgravity, that fundamental sensory um, um, information is gone. Uh, there is no down. And NASA was sort of interested in the challenge that, for, particularly for astronauts who are in microgravity for a relatively long period of time, when they return to Earth, they uh, suffered all sorts of uh, strange phenomena, like an astronaut might bend down in the shower to pick up a cake, cake of soap, and all of a sudden they just lose their balance completely. Or they might be mm. driving around a roundabout and they get become completely spatially disoriented. Um, or indeed some astronauts will return from orbit and they'll be at the podium at a press conference and they'll black out. They'll just have a syncopal event uh, and they'll black out. Um, what's more, calcium leaches out of their bones. And so there were all of these um, fundamental physiological processes that were happening that uh, were as a consequence of long-term exposure to microgravity. And we were particularly interested in how does microgravity impact upon an astronaut's ability to tell where they are in space. So if you think about being in the, the um, space station, uh, there is no down. And so you can be oriented in, in any direction. Uh, and and what, what does that do to your perception of the world? And in particular, if the lights go out in the space station, uh, NASA wanted to know, well, how well can an astronaut tell the direction that they're moving in space? How, If they push off from one wall to go to another wall, would they be able to hit their target um, well if there was no visual cues? Um, so we were really interested in some of those fundamental mechanisms of uh, human self-motion estimation, and in particular, self-motion estimation in the absence of visual information, of auditory information, of proprioceptive information. If you only had to rely on your vestibular system, how well could you tell the direction that you were moving? So that was sort of the, the main aim of the game there. Mm, yeah, really, really interesting. I have uh, once had a kind of experience. I was I was scuba diving and mm -hmm. I got the vertigo where you don't know which way is up and which is down. Yep. And I have to tell that it's really confusing feeling that you lose one of the most kind of basic senses that you have that you know which is up and down so it is it is interesting yeah. so so basically there's two things that how can they orientate in the space in the microgravity and then how are they when they return on earth why are they losing balance Correct. unexpected yeah. yeah and it was that and it was that second piece which actually then kick-started me uh unknowing at the time into the remainder of my career and that was that uh, it's almost like returning to Earth from being in orbit, is that you you almost go through an accelerated aging process. Your bones become um, weaker, your heart muscles become weaker, um, your sense of balance changes, uh, you become spatially disoriented, you black out. And these are all the kinds of things that we see in older adults, um, particularly older adults who fall over a lot. Um, so my... my experience, even though I wasn't at that time particularly interested in aging, led me down a path of saying, hey, well, if you've got this um, neurological uh, system, this bi basic biological system that's involved in your ability to maintain your posture and your movement through the world, and that can be impacted quite dramatically very quickly, I then started thinking about the questions of um, neural adaptation and adaptive sensory mechanisms. And in particular, what happens to our ability to maintain our balance and our ability to move through the world and control our movements if there's mm. a degradation in the fundamental sensory orienting mechanisms of vision, proprioception, and the vestibular system? Yeah, and is the, is the problems with balance, is it the problem of integration of different senses or is it the degradation of certain senses? Yeah, look, I, I would say that it's um, certainly both. Both We know from a lot of the literature around sensory integration that um, humans are, are dominantly visual creatures. M most of us that have sight, um, we use vision very well, um, very precisely. And that's because we've got very high precision information 
that's um, coming in through our eyeballs and hitting our, our occipital cortex and then being processed. Um, but there are other sources of information as well. So, for example, the vestibular system. And some of the work that I did with Heinrich Bultoff at the Max Planck and a postdoctoral fellow of mine at the time, John Butler, who was a mathematician, was to say, what happens if you can combine together a visual source of information that tells you you're moving in a particular direction, a translation forward, for example, but you're on a platform that moves you in a different direction. And then if you've got these two sources of sensory information that are telling you about your your movement through the world, which of them do you trust most or, or how do you resolve the, the differences in those two sources of information? And what we found was that um, a lot of the way in which the brain integrates different sources of information depends on the the amount of noise, noise or certainty in the, the sensory representation. So if you've got a very highly precise visual um, cue as to your direction of motion, you'll tend to use that information um, uh, regardless of all other information. But if, if, the, if you're in the darkness or if the cues for vision aren't all that um, reliable, then you'll start to integrate information com coming from other sensory systems. And, and we showed through a series of psychophysical procedures that you can, the brain integrates both sources of information and what's more, it integrates the amount of uncertainty in both sources of um, information about where you're moving through the world. So it really is a, a question about um, the impact of degradation because that introduces noise into the sensory process and how well the brain mm -hmm. can resolve um that um, noisy process. Yeah. So how, how do you see the, like, could you explain more, how is the noise, for example, in the visual sense? That is it that we get the worst vision and and that's why we cannot keep the balance? So how, how is the noise in visual? Uh, look, there's some really interesting data that's come out of the sort of the monkey neurophysiology literature. And I must admit, I haven't looked at this literature for a couple of years. So thank you for um, sort of, landing me back in that space. But the, the neurons in the, the visual cortex and beyond that process um, fundamental elements of visual motion. And if you think about moving through the world, um, as you move straight ahead in the world, uh, each object in your visual field will move on the retina. And in particular, we know that there are ways that you can characterize the optic flow patterns on the retinal field and that the center of that optic flow pattern, the focus of expansion of the, the radiating optic flow field, um, that can be detected by neurons in monkey cortex, the parts of the monkey brain that are responsive to visual information processing. Um, and what some of the, uh, the literature has shown that is that um, the aging process can significantly impact upon the, the fundamental neural representation of those basic um, visual flow stimuli. Uh, and so if you were to think about how well a, a neuron might respond, a particular neuron or groups of neurons might respond to uh, a, mo a visual motion pattern that's going in a particular direction, uh, they become uh, uh, more noisy in, in their response to that stimulus um, and, and can do that as they age. From human psychophysical studies as well, when you show visual stimuli to old, older and older adults, we can find that they become less able to discriminate um, visual movement in different directions. And so it seems that there is a, a general degradation in their ability to detect the onset or the direction of uh, visual moving stimuli. Mm. Interesting. So, so basically the aging is affecting how we how we sense the the movement when we are losing balance am i right correct yeah yeah and there's there's you know we 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 recruit from a number of different sensory mechanisms to enable us to maintain our balance and this became i guess the the topic of my interest when i returned to australia i applied for a national health and medical research council grant to work with well, one of the world's best researchers in um, postural instability and falls in older people, a guy called Stephen Lord at Neuroscience Research Australia. Uh, and I'd been uh, reading Stephen's papers for a couple of years when I was in Ireland and thinking about um, uh, some of the papers that he was looking at, uh, sensory integration 
in older people and how that's related to their ability to maintain balance. So I thought, ha, here's a way that I can come back to Australia and do some work with um, a leading researcher in an area that I was interested in. So I actually wrote a, uh, this grant application, a fellowship application to come back to Australia to investigate uh, human uh, sensory integration in older adults and its impact upon postural stability and control. Um, now, as occasionally happens in your career, um, what you set out to do isn't what you actually end up doing. Um, and one of the first conversations I had with Steve uh, was really interesting because he said to me, you know, we, we, we've done a lot of research in the area of falls and we know quite a lot about what the determinants of falls are in older people, how we can measure their risk for having a fall, uh, and indeed what we can do to reduce or ameliorate their risk of having a fall. And as happens, uh, lots of strength and balance challenging exercise is a really good way that you can reduce the risk of falls in older adults. But he said to me, despite the fact that we know this, and we know that we can measure fall risk and we can reduce fall risk if we can engage people in enough um, balance challenging exercise, the incidence of falls in community dwelling older adults is still about one in three. Uh, so, hmm. you know, 30, 30% or so of older adults, people aged say 60 and older, will have a fall every year and many of them will fall multiple times. And um, his sort of concern was, well, how do we, how do we reduce that number um, given what we know? Uh, and for me, it was a really interesting question because I'd, I'd done a little bit of work when I was back in Ireland that involved the use of video games in a spinal rehabilitation population. So... I was a, uh, a, an academic at University College Dublin. I had a master's student who came to me one day and he said, look, I, I volunteer in the spinal ward of the local rehab hospital. And spinal wards, as you probably know, are populated by young men who've broken their spines doing dangerous things, playing sport or being in car accidents or whatever. Uh, and my student said, look, we can't get these young guys to engage in their physical rehabilitation. They just won't do it. So I went down to the rehab hospital with him to talk to some of these young guys to see if there was a project that we could work on with them to get them engaged in rehab exercises. Um, and, and they told us that, look, exercise is really boring. These rehab exercises are really boring and we just don't want to do them. We don't get any feedback about how well we're improving or not. Um, and so it's just demotivating. Uh, so we mm. kind of asked them a few questions. And one of the questions we asked them was, what interested you prior to your injury? Because I wanted to see if we could use some of their interest to motivate them to participate in exercise. And the one thing that came out of those um, sort of um, interviews was that these young guys all loved playing video games. And so we thought, all right, well, maybe video games might be a way that we can engage them in, in exercise. And as happened, Sony had released a camera that you could attach to the PlayStation. Uh, it was just a webcam. And they built some games such that body movement could turn into um, game play. So by shifting your torso around and moving your arms around, you could interact with game elements and you could um, play the game. And so we bought one of these PlayStation consoles and put it into the rehab gym. And what we found was that the young guys who previously wouldn't engage in their exercise rehab at all were suddenly desperate to get on and play the video game. So that was sort of one of those points in my career where I went, ah, there's, there's some magic in video games that we could use potentially for changing people's behavior and their attitudes towards exercise. So leap forward a couple of years when I was back in Australia and Steve Lord is telling me that it's really hard to engage people in exercise, older adults in exercise to reduce their risk of falls. And I thought, well, maybe we could use video games. Um, uh, and that was sort of a, a, another point of bifurcation in my career. Um, where I then started to think about how can you use um, exercise-based video games to engage people in exercise. Mm. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian, a research device that has been shown to be valid in tracking sitting, standing, physical activity and energy expenditure. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. And could you tell more about what kind of balancing exercises you had in the video games and how did it work? How, how, how did you get the feedback and how did you provide it to the participants? 
Sure. Look, this was, um, again, one of those things where I didn't have to do very much at all. Uh, I knew that we needed to get people to do lots of balance shifting exercise, so moving their weight from one leg to the other uh, and doing that repeatedly. And when I started thinking about um, game consoles, I know that the Nintendo Wii had just been released and there was a lot of excitement about using that, but I found that a lot of the games were too fast and too hard for older adults to engage with. Um, and so in my kind of landscape um, scoping of the other games that are out there, I found a game called Dance Dance Revolution. Uh, and that was a really simple game and it was almost perfectly suited for my needs because it's it's a game where there's a mat that you put on the floor in front of people that's got some arrows on it in each of the cardinal directions. Um, and then the game is very simple, that there are four target arrows, leftward, rightward, forward, back at the top of the screen, and there are drifting arrows that move up the screen and the task in the game is really simple. You just have to step onto the appropriate arrow on the mat as the drifting arrow crosses the target arrow at the top. And you've probably seen videos of, you know, people playing Dance Dance Revolution. It's set to contemporary music and there's lots of lights and flashing noise and stuff like that. It's a really cool game. Um, obviously, that sort of game was probably a little bit too difficult for many older adults to play. So I embarked upon a process of designing my own video game system where I could uh, slow down the speed of the drifting arrows and I could put into the game music that older adults would like to listen to. Uh, and so I actually didn't know it, but I started a career as a, a technologist and a, a technology developer. I went to China to find a manufacturer of a dance mat that was big enough and, and I could design to my specifications. I found a, a really low-cost computer system that we could put behind a person's TV we could load up onto that an operating system where we stripped away all of the usual features of an operating system and we just had a, a single button in the middle of the screen that they could use to play the game. And I recruited a couple of um, computer science students to help me modify the Dance Dance Revolution game. So we found an open source version of Dance Dance Revolution called Step Mania uh, and we were able to slow down the drifting arrows and put in our own music tracks and all of that kind of stuff managed to convince the National Health and Medical Research Council of Australia to give us some funding to explore the use of this in a, in a home setting. Um, and we ran a few randomised control trials over the years where we demonstrated that um, older adults um, would play this kind of a game system. They enjoyed playing it. Many of them would play more than we recommended to them. And in fact, we mm. could reduce some markers of full risk. And, and that kind of sent me down that whole path of thinking about, well, how can we use video games to get people to exercise? Mm. And and how do you see you probably improve the eye, the visual system and the vestibular system with this kind of exercises? But isn't it also a problem of kind of that the muscles are responding too slowly for a perturbation before a fall. So do you need specific strength exercises for this or is it enough to play this kind of, for example, dance, dance, revolution game? Yeah, look, it certainly does um, work on the ability to generate an, uh, a motor command and for people to move their feet in time. Uh, and you're, de you're absolutely right that a lot of um, the issues with older adults is uh, kind of a deconditioning of their, their muscles. Uh, and so you can do things like add, add weights to them as they're playing the game um, or get them to um, squat. So in additional uh, iterations of the game, you could actually develop a system where they might be uh, walking down a, a virtual um, path and they've got a squat to navigate their way under a low-hanging branch. So you use the body's own weight as a system of um, strengthening their muscles. Mm really really interesting and and how much how widely you have got this to use for the for the fall prevention for example in in australia yeah look, this is um one of the the real challenges i think in research that we as academic researchers we um are very clever and we pull together beautiful grant applications and sometimes we get funded for the work sometimes not and we run our randomized control trials and we get to the end of a study and we've found that hey that works um and then then what um and one of my big frustrations with research was always that inability to translate 
the great work that we do in the laboratory that generates really interesting results and we can publish it in high impact peer reviewed journals that you know everybody else in the world who's interested in that research can read but so rarely do we take that additional leap of commercializing our solutions such that they can go into the market to impact many more people um, and that was certainly my research my frustration with that line of research that I was exploring, that there really wasn't that um, impetus on the part of academic research to take the next step to be able to scale the solutions so that they were available for people. Um, and around about that time, I became really interested in this issue of, well, how do I work better with industry partners to explore ways to um, to commercialize the these results, or at least turn these research results into a solution that can make a difference to people's lives. Uh, now, I sort of maintained a bit of an interest in spinal rehabilitation and also stroke rehabilitation. Uh, and one of the things that I found in uh, in visiting stroke rehab wards was that a lot of patients, again, would be, say, doing constrained-induced movement therapy for rehabilitating their upper limbs following a stroke. So this idea that you... You lock the um, functional limb down. You don't allow people to um, use it at all. And you almost force them to use their dysfunctional limb to move objects from one side of their torso to the other as many times as possible. And this kind of idea of um, addressing those neuroplasticity mechanisms in the brain to try and re regain some function. And I found that, the, again, those exercises were really boring for stroke patients. And I thought, well, surely there's a way that we could pair the video game world with uh, rehabilitation medicine to see if we can build solutions that can get people moving their, their bodies in ways that we want. And, and I landed on thinking about rehabilitating upper limb function in stroke. And at the same time, um, I, I got an iPad. They'd come on the market. And one of the games that I was playing was this game called Fruit Ninja. Uh, and it's a really simple game. I mean, there's virtual um, fruit that gets tossed up in the air in front of you. You swipe your finger across the screen to chop the fruit in half and, and it's really rewarding and exciting. And then lots of fruit comes up and you have to sort of move your hand back and forward really quickly across the screen. And when I was thinking about it, I thought, well, hey, that's mapping onto the kinds of lateral arm movements that stroke patients have to engage in in their upper limb rehabilitation. What if we could give stroke patients this game that's already out there, commercially available, really inexpensive. You can just go onto the app store and you can download it for, I don't know, five bucks or something like that. Um, but again, the game as it was, was too hard for stroke patients to engage in because the fruit moved too quickly. And by the time that they'd swiped their finger, the fruit had gone. So as happened, an Australian company called Half Brick Studios were the developers of Fruit Ninja. And at the time, Fruit Ninja was one of the top selling games on the iPad store. Uh, and it made the guys at from Half Brick Studios very rich, very quickly. So I rang them up mm. one day just out of the blue and managed to get through to the, the CEO of the company, a guy called Chanel Dio, and I explained to him what I wanted to do. And essentially, I thought there might be one or two parameters in the code of the game that controlled the speed of the fruit. And I said, look, Chanel, if you could slow down the fruit, I could put it in front of stroke patients and they'd play the game and I reckon they'd really love it. Um, and he said, well, I understand completely what you're saying because I've had family members that have had a stroke and I've seen them go through this. Uh, uh, let me throw a couple of my guys at it. And a few weeks later, I got a modified version of Fruit Ninja that I could uh, trial with stroke patients and found that they really enjoyed playing it. Um, uh, I can make available a couple of videos showing you how this worked. Uh, yeah. Uh, and so that was, that was fantastic. Um, we showed that, yes, uh, using a commercial off-the-shelf video game that was widely accessible and available, there was the possibility of doing rehabilitation in a brand new way. Um, but again, and we didn't even have funding for that project. It was just sort of something that we, we engaged in. I, I built a relationship with a, a rehab clinician at a, a local hospital in Sydney, and we just trialed it and found that it was, um, it looked like it was going to be something that we could use. Um, but then we were un unable to convince any funding agency that they should fund us to pursue this a little bit further. And, uh, years went on and, and, um, the relationship with Half Brick Studio sort of died, died away. Uh, and so in the background, I've still got this frustration of how do we translate things into the commercial world? Um, and, and it's been, to be honest, one of my ongoing frustrations throughout the rest of my career. How do we 
how do we translate our research into something that makes commercial sense? Um, but I think mm. we're, we're, we're kind of getting there. Yeah. So what do you see that the academia should do differently that they could actually get the research in into practical use? Mm. This is something that I'm, I'm deeply uh, passionate about. How do we bring together these two fields, the the field of research uh, and the field of industry and commercial um, endeavour? And to be honest, there's a lot of scepticism on both sides of that fence. Um, academics will look at what happens in the commercial world and and they might say, well, that's just you know they're out to make money. Um, whenever they whenever a commercial entity wants to come and talk to me, I think I get the feeling that they're just trying to pick my brains uh, and make money for themselves. And then on the commercial side of the fence, they tend to look at academics as these head in the clouds researchers who are passionate about doing research, but really don't have a notion about how to commercialize anything. And in in some sense, those two perspectives are true. I mean, the, there are different priorities in both fields. The, the KPIs that we have in academia are about publications, grants, PhD students graduated, and the KPIs that people have in the commercial world about making sales. It's pretty simple. You've got to sell. You've got to make money. And so straight away, there are these tensions between the two. But uh, luckily, I think there is an increasing awareness, certainly in Australia, that we need to do things that better brings together those two communities so that we can actively start to think about how you translate from the laboratory. And, and a lot of it's about uh, learning the language of the other. So how do you as an academic best understand the world from the eyes of a commercial partner? And so too for the commercial partner to better understand the world from the perspective of an academic. Uh, and I, I guess I've, I've stepped away from fundamental research a few years ago to really start to pursue that Um, way of thinking a little bit more. Um, so I don't tend to do so much research myself anymore, although I'm still um, on some legacy grants and, and I'm still co-supervising a couple of PhD students. Um, but my real interest now is is in that field of bringing together academia and and research. And it's a it's a long, slow process, but I think it's a very important process. Uh, and it's it's aided and abetted through various funding mechanisms. So I know in Europe there is lots of funding that's available, particularly to bring together researchers and industry. So a lot of the Horizon 2020 grants are about building consortia of academics and um, commercial entities. And I've been involved in a couple of those. And in Australia as well, we have a, a number of different mechanisms for um, leveraging government funding to bring together uh, researchers in academia and commercial partners to try and um, move towards commercial outcomes. Mm. Yeah, I, I I can fully fully agree with your points. I, I also come from the university background and then I have moved more to the industry to a spin-off startup company and I can really see that the languages are different how to how to understand each other. And yes, the KPIs are are different. Do you see some practical steps? that both the industry should take to come closer to academia and practical mm. step for academia to come closer to industry. Yeah, absolutely. It's embedding each other in each other's fields. So I, I really um, value and promote any opportunity that I have to work with an industry partner who can spend time in my laboratory, or at least I did when I was in academia, and also too um, to give Uh, PhD students and postdoctoral fellows and even other academics the opportunity to spend time working within industry and industry partners. Uh, and so I think that's the key. Um, this is about uh, communication and trust, trusted relationship building. And I think the best thing that you can do is to make sure that you don't bite off more than you can chew to begin with, to really set goals for small projects that have got clear outcomes, clear achievable outcomes that can be done within a constrained amount of time that meets not necessarily the sort of the three-year horizon that academics might have, but might be much faster, might be six or 12-month projects. Uh, and to work on a number of those small rapid projects 
uh, and build a trusted relationship. This is all about building trust and breaking down the barriers in perspective between the two camps. Um, so I think that's the way forward, that if we get much more industry engagement in universities and university engagement in industry, that we can really um, break down those barriers and, and achieve um, much better outcomes. Mm, that that makes sense. I, I don't know if I have understood correctly, but I think in, in France, for example, when you do a PhD, you need to work in the industry part mm -hmm. of the time uh, when you're doing doing your PhD. Do you think this could be a solution to bring the academia people closer to industry? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, the, uh, the fellowship that I came back to Australia on, the National Health and Medical Career uh, Fellowship, was an industry-flavoured version of that. So I had an industry partner that was Intel that was um, a part of that. And so that through that funding mechanism, I actually had the opportunity then to work closely with those industry partners. Um, and and I, I know that there are industry-funded PhD scholarships in various countries. Um, the challenge, of course, always is that the goal for a young PhD is to be able to publish. In fact, these days, um, the, the responsibility to publish or the need to publish is much greater than when I was a graduate student. I mean, I, I was unusual that I came out of my PhD with three peer-reviewed publications to my name before I, I got out of my PhD. Um, these days, it seems that PhD students need to have five, six, seven publications to their name if they've got any chance at all of getting a postdoctoral fellowship or a faculty position. And so sometimes when you do work with an industry partner who is funding your scholarship, your fellowship, um, and you're working in an area that might they might not be quite prepared to release to the market, then they can have a, um, a kind of a moratorium on your results being um, published. Now, this this was a problem for a, a fellow PhD a student when I was going through. She was funded through a, a pharmaceutical industry fellowship um, working on a particular um, drug product, and they were able to hold um, publication of her results um, off for a year or two after she'd finished her PhD. So for her, that was really problematic because she couldn't get the currency of PhDs out there. Um, so we, we do need to be kind of conscious of um, ensuring that the graduate student is able to uh, get out of the industry uh, partnership what they need to progress as a, a young researcher. Mm. And I, I, I think quite often it comes to really simple things. I think the same is like when you have startup incubators, when big companies are creating incubators. I think mm. the, the most of the benefit is that they are within the same building and maybe they have a, a cafeteria where you have some interaction between people and they end up talking and then they are like, oh, there's actually a, we, we could have a synergy here. So I yeah. think it's, it might be also about physical locations. Do people go to eat lunch and have a coffee at the mm -hmm. same space? How do you see yeah. it? I, th I think that's really important. I absolutely do. And I know a number of universities in Australia have set up these kind of um, co-working incubative um, hubs, mostly kind of built under the assumption that um, the smart young people in university degrees will think about um, – spinning off their own companies and they'll go through the incubator process attached to the university. Uh, sometimes that works, sometimes not. Uh, to be honest, I've seen a lot of those kinds of facilities in Australia where they end up being cheap rent for local businesses rather than incubators in the way that they should be. Um, the other big challenge, of course, is that a lot of the, the courses that the undergraduate courses that are being taught in university today a young person coming through might look at uh, doing a degree in economics or business and finance or engineering or whatever, and in fact they come with they come pre-equipped with a whole bunch of skills to start building products right now, and many of them um, don't necessarily even need to go through a full three or four year undergraduate degree program, where they might be spat out the end of that program with a degree saying that hey you're a bachelor of engineering, they can pick up what they need through online courses. And so they might say, hey, I need to learn R, programming language R. I can go and do a course through Coursera 
where I can learn from some of the best people in the world in the use of R. Or maybe it's a, a course on 3D printing and they can kind of stitch together for themselves the skills that they need to build their own businesses. So I think one of the challenges that uh, we face in, in universities is that we're not agile and responsive enough to the demand that's being created by young, clever people who are wanting to build their own businesses and their own startups um, to mm -hmm. fill the, the gaps in the markets that they perceive. I know for, I know for myself that if I was uh, 20 again, uh, and that was many years ago, and I was thinking about wanting to develop technologies in the exercise and sports science space, um, I probably wouldn't go through a degree to learn much about exercise and sports science. I might partner with people that have that expertise, but I'd bring together a group of individuals who had skills in coding and design and marketing and analysis and big data analytics, um, and I would stitch them together to build a company that could explore that commercial pathway. Mm, it makes sense. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Fibian is an accurate sitting and physical activity tracking device and analysis platform. It is a great tool for projects that aim for behavior change in sedentary behavior and incidental physical activity. Fibian provides easy-to-understand PDF and web browser reports for participants. Other features include comparisons to recommendations, linking results to health risks, achievement cards, and interactive goal-setting tool. In addition, Fibian provides an API that allows for easy integration to other systems and applications. Learn more about Fibian at fibian.com research. Fibian from researchers to researchers. So what would be your advice when when researcher is starting collaboration with industry and how could they avoid the, the common pitfalls? Yep. Um, always, always, always try and see the world through the lens of the commercial partner. Do your research in the same way that you would do your research in trying to understand some fundamental physiological mechanism or whatever it is that your academic interest is, um, learn as much as possible about the industry partner, um, where they're situated in their value network. So each industry partner will essentially sell a product of some sort, um, but they will sell within a, a marketplace. And that marketplace will have a whole range of other actors along the, the value network. It might be distributors, it might be um, organizations that they procure components from. It might be uh, their, their, their market, their, their clients, their consumers. There's, there's many different actors that you need to understand. And I think the best thing that a young researcher can do if they're thinking about um, pursuing commercial relation or relationships with commercial partners is to try to see the world through their lens. Uh, it's certainly uh, a kind of a, uh, an approach that I took when I came back to Australia, I thought, okay, I've, I've been in academia long enough. Um, I'm starting to get grants through formal granting mechanisms, but I don't yet understand the world from the perspective of an industry partner. And I don't want to go to an industry partner and say, hey, uh, industry partner person, you've got lots of money and lots of equipment and stuff that I need to use. Here's what I want to do. Can you give me money or can you give me equipment to do that? Um, that will immediately close the door for you. Instead, if you go to the industry partner and you you say to the particular person that you might have, hey, Simon, um, I see that your company is using this product in this particular way. That's really interesting. I've been thinking about other ways that, that you could potentially make use of that te technology or that solution or approach. That opens the door. Um, so that's the first step. And then it's about building trust. Um, so don't go in there promising that you can solve all of the challenges. Focus in with a laser-like focus on one thing that you know that you're going to be able to do and do really well and do it quickly. Um, the, the biggest challenge to trust is that when you get in the door of a commercial partner and you've got them to a point where they've agreed to work with you, 
not delivering on what you agreed to deliver is the death knell for your ongoing relationship with that commercial partner because they're so busy um, and they've got really tight time constraints that you've got to be able to um, work as quickly as they do in going to market. Now, I've also worked in the commercial world and it, it sort of also does frustrate me that imperative to do things quickly without thinking things through. Uh, and I, I had an experience recently with a, a commercial partner where that really frustrated me because something went out too soon before it was really ready. Uh, and you're left thinking, oh, I could have done that much better. Um, so there's a, a bit of a, a balance to be struck, certainly, uh, of that academic intellectual rigor and commercial reality. And, and finding your way through that is hard. But you can do that if you if you build up a long-term set of projects that you work with a, a partner in a trusted way. So they'd be the two mm. important things. Yeah, really good good points. And how, how would you say it then the other way? What's it industry be be thinking when collaborating with academia and how to avoid the common pitfalls pitfalls yeah yeah and it, and it is about first of all that understanding of um the drivers in academia and the constraints that are placed upon academics and being as flexible as possible in working with academics in that way um for them not to be um too biased in their perspective about an academic i mean there are clever clever people in academia that aren't all head in the clouds, blue sky thinkers. Um, there are really innovative entrepreneurial mindsets in academia. Uh, and if industry could recognize how best to make uh, engagement with those kinds of people, then I think the relationships will be very positive um, going you know, in an ongoing fashion. Also to realize that there are opportunities to um, for your business to benefit from engaging in research. So in Australia, we've got research and development tax incentives for a company. So you can um, have a, a tax offset um, if you engage, if you invest a certain amount of your, your resources in research activities. So there's a, a bit of an incentive there for the, the company to engage. And there are also other um, leverage funding opportunities. So be prepared to kick in cash to a partnership um, if you're an industry partner, and it doesn't even have to be very much cash. I mean, $50,000 from an industry partner, well, for some SMEs, that might be a lot of money, but uh, you can get a typically a, a certainly a return on your investment if you agree to work with a, a university partner that leverages government funding of some sort. So you kick in $50,000 of cash, the project in total would be worth $100,000. Um, or if you kick in cash and in kind contributions, then you can increase the amount of funding that you can get through some of these leveraged funding mechanisms. So to go in with an open eye, I'm um, thinking about how you can maximize the opportunity for getting access to funding, um, where ordinarily, if you wanted to do research on your own, you might have to self-fund your research or find some kind of, an, kind of an investor that would be expecting a return on that investment pretty quickly. But if you go to a, a, a leverage funding mechanism through a, a state or a federal government um, mechanism, then um, whilst you have to kick in money, certainly, you get money in return and there is often no um, expectation that there's going to be a, a massive and ongoing return on investment for that for that initial investment. Mm. Yeah, um, I think – yeah, please go on. Uh, I, I think the other thing is to, um, to become familiar, like – uh, if you're a young startup or if you're in industry, there's lots of talks that are given by academics that are available to the public. So familiarize yourself with uh, the work of researchers. Um, go to the, the conferences. I mean, there's many industry conferences that uh, academics talk at. And similarly, there's many academic conferences that industry partners are at. So be prepared to sort of do that, uh, that work in understanding the world of the academic. Mm. Yeah, really good points related to translational research and how to how to bring academia and industry closer. If we move to another team, you have been also doing uh, research with older adults, physical activity and and cognition. Could you tell more about these studies? Yeah, this this sort of sprang from the work that I did originally looking at uh, fall risk reduction in older adults. 
one of the one of my PhD students at the time, a really bright guy from Germany called Daniel Schoner, he um, he ran uh, his PhD looking at the uh, cognitive benefits of engaging in these exercise based video games. So not only do these video games get you to move your body, but at the same time that you're moving your body and increasing your heart rate you're being asked to solve some fairly complex cognitive challenges. I mean, the Dance Dance Revolution game is a really simple game, but in fact, it has some level of cognitive resources that are required. And the more increasingly sophisticated uh, games that are out there now that, that capture body movements and use those captured body movements to turn um, to play games um, have really good opportunities to throw cognitive challenge at people. And I've become increasingly interested in the literature, although I must admit haven't done much work in this area myself, around the combined impact of increased heart rate over some sustained period, whilst at the same time getting people to solve complex cognitive challenges. Uh, now, it's, a, it's an emerging literature, and we don't have sort of the definitive data out there yet. Um, but I think it's the the place to to look at um, what is the the impact of um, both physical activity and cognitive challenge on overall cognitive health, uh, social health, physical health, uh, indeed emotional health. We know that there's um, some also some really good research, particularly done by a, an excellent young researcher here in Australia, Simon Rosenbaum, who has is a, a an exercise physiologist who's looked at the impact of exercise on uh, depression and on mental health. Uh, and I think mm. that's also a really fascinating area of research um, to look at getting people to move their body, increase their heart rate, engage in, in exercise, and the impact that that can have on, on mental health, I think is um, a really fascinating area with some, some excellent results that are starting to come out. So uh, I'm, I'm generally, I guess, interested in older adults. Um, that's sort of the area that I've worked in mostly over the past decade or so. And in particular, how can we get older people to um, engage in more physical activity? Uh, and in particular, how can we use technology to help them do that? So I'm really interested in exploring exercise-based video games so that a person who maybe at the moment is homebound because of the lockdowns through coronavirus, how can you use the living room, the home living room, and the television set that everybody is familiar with how can we use that as a portal through which people can engage in exercise? Um, so either through uh, video game consoles that get people moving their bodies around or potentially making use of the wearable uh, physical activity trackers like Fitbit and Garmin and others. How, how do we take data from those devices, which are increasingly sophisticated and capture not just step information but heart rate information, admittedly not as well as maybe some of the the gold standard medical devices, although there is lots of data starting to come out to show that these sorts of devices are as good as the standard um, devices. And I believe your own company probably is working in that space as well. How do we use the data from those devices to engage people in everyday, in, in incidental exercise? Uh, a few years ago, I was interested in the idea of taking data from a Fitbit device and building a game that you would navigate through that was driven by your step count. This was back when, when Fitbit only really supplied step counts. Um, and I, I realized that there was this massive uptake in devices like Fitbit and lots of people were interested in, well, how can they use that? Um, particularly people who weren't necessarily the, the sporty types, the people who were engaging in exercise anyway, but people who need to engage in exercise. So the people who are most at risk for chronic disease and, and sort of lifestyle-related diseases. How do we get them moving their body and how can we use these sorts of technologies to motivate them to move their bodies? Um, and while I was at the University of Tasmania a number of years ago, I developed an online course that I called Foundations of Technology for Healthy Living. And this was a short course. It was eight weeks. It was free for anybody to enroll in. And we taught them in, in that course some fundamentals about the importance of engaging in physical activity and exercise. And I interviewed exercise physiology colleagues of mine, and they went through some of the fundamentals of why is exercise good for you and how much exercise is good for you. We looked at diet and nutrition. We looked at the cognitive challenges that people might face in engaging in exercise. 
we taught them about the technology that goes into a Fitbit device. So how is it that a Fitbit counts your steps? And then every student who enrolled in the course got a free Fitbit. Uh, I did a bit of a deal with Fitbit Australia uh, and everybody received a Fitbit. And we had a team of young um, game developers in Launceston in Tasmania at the time develop for me a game that was driven by step count. And essentially it was a really simple game. It was a sort of a race around the world game, not particularly novel. Um, so we would set people up in teams such that the progression of the icon that represented a team through a map was driven by the combined step count of the team. Uh, and we found that that was a really fun and engaging way for people to participate in incidental physical activity. And we could do things like uh, sh give a shout out to people um, on their phone in the app and say, if you increase your step rate over the next 30 minutes by 200%, then you'll get some badges or stars that contribute towards your overall progression in the game. So I'm sort of really interested in how we can make use of those kinds of technologies, particularly for older people, to engage them in increased amounts of physical activity. Mm. So, so what do you see as a, what would be a dream, ideal dream or ideal activity tracker for elderly? What kind of features it should have and what kind of functionality, maybe ease of use? How, how could we make it make it really useful with the elderly people? Yeah. Look, to answer that question, you'd have to ask older people. I think this is important that I have some sort of preconceptions about what a, a good system might include. And that would be, for me, first and foremost, the ability for a, a clinician to be able to monitor and track the engagement of a number of people for whom you are delivering clinical services. So if, from my perspective, that would be an important feature of this solution. Um, for the the individual, I think it's really important that they co-create and co-design the solution that they want to use. Um, too many technologies in our everyday life have been designed by young, clever designers and technologists and digital people that build solutions um, for essentially others like them. Uh, and when we try and apply some of those solutions to an older cohort, um, we find that there can be a disconnect and that the solutions don't actually meet the needs of that older cohort. Um, so, for example, the, the Nintendo Wii game that I mentioned a while ago, it was a great game, really good for getting people to move their body. Um, but when you try to use those games in an older cohort, they just weren't fit for purpose. They they required movements that were too fast or through a greater range of movement than might have been possible for older adults. And I think it's really important that if you were to design a game solution, that would be the ideal solution for that cohort, that you ask that cohort first and foremost to be participants in the design process. Um, so I'm, I'm a big fan of co-creation, um, co-design, um, and I've tried to do that throughout my career whenever I've designed a new solution. So I don't know what that solution would look like. Um, that would come out of that co-creation process. Uh, one of the PhD students that I'm co-supervising at the moment is a, a young physiotherapist who is addressing this in a in a patient cohort of people with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, and he's gone through a process of bringing together groups of COPD, people living with COPD and technologists to design the games that they would like to engage with um, that are driven by, uh, say, a Fitbit device. So I think that's the that's really the secret sauce. Ask them what they want, and then if they help you design it, then they've got ownership of it. And if they've got ownership of it, well, they're going to use it. Mm. Really simple advice, but so often forgotten co-creation and actually asking from the from the participants. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. My name is uh, Tarja Jövåg. I'm associate professor at Oslo Metropolitan University. Currently, I'm using Fibion in a project where we investigate activities of daily life in people with uh, lower limb amputation. My impression is that Fibion is easy to implement in this project. It's easy to use and it's also simple to upload and analyze the data. How could you see that we could use the activity trackers in the current 
situation in the world that we have actually the elderly people are in self-isolation and it might really last for a long time that they mm -hmm. will actually, if they are not moving, there will be quite the big consequences in their physical function. So how could we actually use already now these activity trackers to... Yeah, good question. Really important question. And it is one of my my greatest concerns, particularly for those older adults who are residents in aged care facilities, um, who may now be uh, confined more to their rooms and aren't engaging in any kind of exercise. Uh, my greatest fear is that those older adults will decondition to the extent that we'll see deaths in a couple of months that aren't as a consequence of coronavirus, but they're actually as a consequence of the fact that these people just haven't been moving their bodies and they become so deconditioned. So I think it's a really important um, issue that we need to address, both for uh, older people who are in residential aged care, but also everybody else, um, older adults who are living in their own homes in the community. Um, we could, uh, say for example, really extend the notion of connectivity. I mean, coronavirus has disconnected us socially. Well, it hasn't disconnected us socially necessarily because we're using Zoom and all these different video chat services to maintain our social connection, but it's, it's disconnected us spatially. So it's the social connection which binds us together and has always bound us together. This is where I like games. Um, Games have been part of our humanity since forever. Uh, since we first picked up sticks and tossed them around, we've sort of explored ways that we can play together. Um, play is deeply fundamentally part of not just the human condition, but the entire animal condition. I mean, I've got a couple of dogs that love nothing more than playing with me. Um, so that's one part of our humanity. Um, communication and creativity, art, craft, design, music, storytelling are also deeply fundamentally human activities. And when we marry together those creative pursuits and play um, with artifacts, tools, then we create games. Particularly if we wrap structure around play, then we have games and, and games have been with us forever. I mean, some of the earliest board games are over two and a half thousand years old. Um, and, and, and games really uh, have been part of, our, part of our humanity forever. When we wrap competition around games <clears throat> and physicality, well, that, that's sport. And we know how deeply engaging sport is on a, on a global level. Um, so these are all elements that I think that we can make use of to better engage us in physical activity in these times when we are spatially isolated from each other. And digital games, sort of computer games, video games, have been with us for such a, a relatively recent part of our history, but everybody has played games, no matter how young or old they are. And I think if we could leverage the the digital sensing capabilities of some of these physical activity trackers that capture data about our movement and we can turn that into games then i think that's a way that we might be able to engage people in sustained health related behavior change um, so is it the case that if you've got a physical activity tracker and it's measuring your heart rate um, then if you engage in activities that gets your heart rate to between 50 and 70 percent of maximal for 20 minutes a day, we know that's going to have some real physiological benefits for you. And that's a piece of data. Well, that piece of data is data that you're generating. Now, let's say that you use that piece of data to drive your navigation through some collaborative game that's happening amongst your friends, your family, or the broader global community. Uh, I think, you know, smart, clever software developers and game developers could work very closely with exercise physiologists and behavior change specialists to come up with solutions that engage us socially, engage us physically, cognitively, emotionally um, over a long, sufficiently long periods of time that we can accrue real physiological, social, emotional and cognitive benefit. Um, I don't know what that perfect solution is yet. I know that some of the, the physical activity tracker companies have built into their solutions uh, game-based elements. I know that Fitbit have got a, a way that you can hike your way up the Matterhorn. Um, 
so those sorts of things are there. But maybe if we built more collaborative, play-based experiences, that will help those older adults compete, say, against their grandkids. I mean, one of the things when I mm. first started playing with video games and older people, they'd say, oh, look, you know, my, my grandkids are just so good at this that they'll always beat me. Well, that doesn't have to be the case. I mean, in the digital world, you can level the playing field. And so it might take the, the grandkid, you know, a lot of effort to navigate their way through the game where it doesn't take the older adult who isn't as physically capable to match them or even beat them. So I think there's some interesting stuff that can be done in this space, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I, I think those were really good points. How do you see now that this is a really acute problem, like you said, that there might be deaths even in a couple of months just from the deconditioning? So the mm. thing is going on now and the self-isolation will last. So what could we do already now and how, yeah, how to do it? Yeah, and, and this is where I think uh, COVID has actually opened up enormous worlds of opportunity Uh, for us. Um, a, there's not as much of traveling around by polluting crafts. So we're seeing globally reductions in pollution, and that's great for the planet. It's great for our well-being, great for our health. Um, we're all businesses and education facilities alike uh, have pivoted towards using um, uh, remote team engagement solutions. So I can't tell you how many Zoom calls I've been over on in the last few weeks. Uh, and, and what's more, um, in Australia, certainly, there is now government Medicare item numbers for a clinician who will deliver a clinical service using telehealth technologies, so essentially video communication technologies. A number of us have been working in the field of telehealth for years, and we've always butted up against the fact that whilst the technology is sufficiently mature, that we know that we can roll out telehealth services. And we know that there is at least some level of technological literacy amongst clinicians. There's always been a barrier to uptake, widespread and scaled uptake of telehealth technologies. But now, um, because a clinician can't be face-to-face -face with their patients, the government has opened up the opportunity for those clinicians to charge for a teleconsultation service. And we're seeing all sorts of really innovative ways that clinicians who previously wouldn't have thought about using telehealth are now uh, using it. So to give you an example, a young physiotherapist that I know here in New South Wales used to deliver exercise programs into residential aged care. Now, he's unable, he and his staff are unable to physically be present in residential aged care to deliver those exercise programs to those older people in, in care. But what he's now doing is that he's using uh, video communication platforms like Zoom to run every Thursday morning in Australia. He runs an exercise class, not for the older adults themselves, but for the carers who are actually in residential aged care so that he can train them to deliver exercise programs to those older people uh, on a regular basis. So very quickly, we've seen this world where in many ways it's doom and gloom and terrible things are happening and Um, people are dying that shouldn't be dying. But we're also seeing people who are being innovative um, because they have to be innovative and they can leverage the tools that are already there to deliver these kinds of programs. So we're already seeing it. We're already seeing uh, innovative exercise physiologists and physiotherapists and occupational therapists and all those clinical um, uh, professions that are involved in getting people to move their bodies, making use of technological solutions like video or like Fitbit or any of those activity trackers to get people to engage in in exercise. And I think we'll see lots more of that over the coming month or two. Mm. And and what what games you would re recommend that are already out there? What could the older people or or maybe people with stroke use already at this point? Yeah, look, there, there, there's uh, a number of solutions that I've been working with over the years. There's one in particular called Gintronics, uh, J-I-N-T-R-O-N-I-X, that we've done some work with stroke patients. Um, and this is a solution where it uses a, a 3D motion capture camera that used to be attached to an Xbox, a Microsoft Xbox console, to capture body movements. But what the guys at Gintronics did very cleverly was to use that 
3D motion capture capability of the Kinect camera and map those three-dimensional postures into gameplay, and in particular gameplay that is driven by um, the sorts of rehabilitation needs that are required if you're somebody who's recovering from a stroke. Uh, so there are software solutions out there like Gintronics and a number of others that are making use of game technology to engage people in an exercise. A, um, a good friend of mine in the US, Cheryl Flynn, has a company called the Blue Marble Health Company. And she's also got a solution that is very similar, but it doesn't necessarily rely on a, a camera to capture body movements. It, it sends to people in their home a series of exercises that they can do that are particular for their own maybe chronic disease condition. Um, at the commercial end, I mean, these are highly specific sort of clinical tools. Um, at the commercial end, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of a game called Beat Saber, and that leverages... Um, virtual reality technology. So you put the uh, VR headset on your head and you become immersed in this really simple arcade game where there are blocks that come towards you and in front of you, you can sort of see your hands and they represent a laser, like a, a lightsaber. And your job is just to chop the blocks that, as they come towards you. It's a game that's very similar to Dance Dance Revolution that I worked with years ago. Uh, and I've got to tell you, if you play that game for 20 minutes, um, you will get your heart rate elevated no matter how fit you are and come out of it sweating. So I think there are some really interesting solutions like that. I know there's another boxing game that's along the same uh, same path. It really depends on your, I guess, your um, financial capacity um, and uh, I guess in some sense your ability to take on risk. I know a lot of people have bought uh, virtual reality immersive goggles and uh, and forget where they are because they become immersed within a virtual world and and they're playing these games and all of a sudden they're tripping over the couch. Um, so uh, use at your own uh, peril for some of these games. Oh. Yeah, good good points. Uh, so it has been really interesting discussions. Uh, we have been going one hour and fifty minutes, so maybe we can start to wrap up. So. You are doing many interesting things and you have nice networks in industry and in the academia. Uh, are you looking for some kind of collaboration and what kind of projects you have upcoming? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm always open for collaboration from both uh, academic partners and industry partners. And they don't necessarily have to be in Australia. Uh, for example, I'm really interested in working with a team in Singapore who have uh, over the years, built up a an international exergaming Olympics where they get together uh, teams of older adults from across the world who are trained in the use of exercise-based video games by younger people. And there is an annual competition, a sort of a, an Olympic Games in exergaming. Um, really interested in, in pursuing those kinds of collaborations. So if there's anybody in your network that would be interested to chat to me about um, how they might engage in in those kinds of uh, game-based uh, solutions, either to find funding through various funding agencies to, to do some research, or indeed um, commercial partners that might be interested in learning more about how to uh, engage people in exercise using interactive technologies. Um, I'm certainly up for, for that collaboration. I, I run my own consultancy called Exercise Cognition, and really I've set this up post my career in academia to try and translate some of the the expertise and experience that I built up over a couple of decade, decades in research into uh, commercial solutions that can impact um, uh, the health and well-being of, of a broad cross-section of people. Um, so always open for, uh, for collaboration. Um, I'm particularly really interested in the idea of combined physical challenge and cognitive challenge. I think that's a, uh, an interesting space. Um, the research literature is starting to uh, gain momentum in, in that area. And, and I think there are potentially some solutions that can be built. I know certainly um, a, um, a researcher in the US, Kay Anderson Hanley at Union College, has done some really good research in people who are um, cognitively impaired, older adults who are cognitively impaired, and she provides them a, a cycling-based solution, so an, an exit a game that's built around a, a recumbent bicycle. Uh, and as people uh, engage in this cycling exercise, they can also solve cognitive challenges. And it looks like it's having some impact upon their, 
their cognitive ability. So I'm really keen to work with people like Kay and others that are keen to explore more um, solutions that can engage people, not just physically, but cognitively as well. Mm. So you're doing consultancy work, and if people are interested, where can they find info and how, how can they contact you the easiest way? Yeah, probably the best way is to either check me out on Twitter. Um, I'm pretty active on Twitter, so my Twitter handle is Stu, S-T-U, Smith, S-M-I-T-H, uh, 2454, um, or email me, Stu, S-T-U, at exercisecognition.com, exercisecognition, one word, dot com. Um, but I can make available uh, links to both my Twitter feed, my LinkedIn feed, uh, and uh, my email for publication on the website. Yeah, sounds sounds good. So hopefully some of the gaming companies will be contacting you. I think it's a good opportunity to, to actually modify the games to fit the current need for for the risk groups and elderly people. Uh, so what would be your final remarks? Uh, look, I, I really appreciated the chance to uh, chat with you and, and certainly to listen in on the other podcasts that you've put out there. Really excellent service. And I do uh, acknowledge you in, in pulling this together. Um, I think there are opportunities that we can make use of technology in innovative, interesting ways that uh, if we engage the people who we want to engage, who we want to be doing more physical activity uh, in the design process, then I'm sure that we'll come up with some really in- interesting and worthwhile solutions that can help them shift their needle on their own engagement in health-related behaviours. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the nice, nice words, and it was really a pleasure. It was really interesting points, and thanks a lot for taking the time for this podcast. Or oh, it's my pleasure. I really, uh, really enjoyed it. This podcast is sponsored by Fibian. Get scientific validation and learn more about Fibian at fibian.com slash research. The Physical Activity Researcher podcast has created an activity tracker purchase guide for researchers. Get your free copy from the link in the podcast description. Thank you for listening to the Physical Activity Researcher podcast.